Hello, Open Heart Project. I hope you are well. I hope you are healthy and feeling cared for and steady. And I hope the same is so for all your loved ones. It is my honor uh, and privilege to show up in your inbox with something that I hope will be useful to you. I, I truly know that one of the most useful things we can do in very difficult times is practice meditation, meaning allowing ourselves to just relax our minds for a little bit, because there's so much to think about and grasp and plan and fear and hope for and so on. So if we look at meditation as nothing else, we can look at it as an opportunity to rest from figuring things out, analyzing, planning, and so on. So we will do that uh, shortly. I want to continue the talk that I started last week very briefly, so well, maybe five minutes, seven minutes, something like that, and then we'll sit. So please take your seat and get settled, whether you're on a cushion on the floor with your legs crossed loosely in front of you or in the equally spiritual chair. Chair is fine. Uh, please sit with your feet flat on the floor. And if you don't feel well, you are welcome to, um, I just like to make sure this is on, lie down. So last week, I suggested that something I think that I can offer that is helpful is some insight into what in Buddhism is called the six paramitas or transcendent actions. And the reason I think these teachings are so um, relevant is because they actually say what to do. This isn't, they're not necessarily only philosophical or they're certainly not intellectual. They're not ideas. They are actions, transcendent actions that you can take to help you transcend. Now, what, from what to what would be a very natural next question. So we're not trying to transcend into some other realm. We're not trying to transcend into being someone else or getting away from our world. What we are transcending is chaos, uncertainty, insanity, you could even say, and we are attempting to go to the other shore, as it is sometimes described. And what is on the other shore is the opposite. Ease, clarity, safety, joy. So how do you get there? How do you, how do you, how do you make that arc? How do you make that trip? Well, there's six steps. The first step that we talked about last week is the foundational step. It's called generosity. And Generosity, it is said, is the virtue that produces peace. Without a sense of generosity toward yourself first, towards others, towards this world, the idea of being able to transcend difficulty is uh, very limited. So we started with generosity. If you want to go back and listen to that one, great, but you don't have to. Um, the second... Uh, Paramita is called discipline. So generosity can have this sense, and accurately so, of being beneficent and open and spacious and giving and soft and sweet. Excellent. <clears throat> discipline can have the sense of something a little harder. Also excellent. Because we need to be sharp and clear in our actions, not just in a time of pandem pandemic, but altogether. So generosity without discipline can be very sappy. And discipline without generosity can be harsh. So the paramitas build on each other. So to uh, generosity, we add now discipline, the second paramita. And for me, or for many of us in the West, I think the discipline carries with it the connotation of something harsh something tight, something 
willpower-y or like means you make yourself do the things you really don't want to do. But through the lens of the paramitas, that this is not how discipline is defined. It's actually somewhat opposite. Rather than being something hard and willful, discipline here has the sense of uh, openness and flexibility. Because the primary discipline that we are seeking to cultivate is the discipline of being with what is. Usually, and this is quite understandable, me too, we're human, are rather than being with what is, I I tend to be with what I hope will happen or what I fear will happen. That is what primarily gets my attention. And here the discipline is to say, well, don't forget about yourself, but make the intention, rouse the aspiration, cultivate the habit of paying attention to what is here, to others, for example to the truth and of the qualities that happen to be present right now. So that's the discipline that we're seeking to cultivate. So the best definition I ever heard of discipline in the Buddhist view is simply coming back. So if you have ever meditated, you know that you sit there, you place your attention on the breath, your mind strays, because you're normal, and then you let go and come back. That gesture, whoop, that's what is meant by discipline. You have the discipline to come back. And if you meditate, you actually know how. So it's, you're not just hoping for the best. So please know that when you meditate, every time you make that gesture of mind of noticing you're lost in thought and letting go and coming back, it's like doing a discipline curl in the gym. So you're, you're strengthening that muscle. So again, it's not about forcing yourself or being super willful. It's simply about coming back, which is a responsive gesture, a in-the-moment skill, rather than making yourself do things you'd rather not. Uh, Although sometimes we have to do that too. We talked last week about the three forms of generosity giving material things, giving the gift of dharma, and giving the gift of fearlessness. Discipline, too, has three categories that I'll share with you very briefly. And the first is uh, called binding yourself, binding yourself. And this means all sorts of things. It doesn't mean tying yourself up in knots. Uh, It means committing. Like, okay, I get that this is what discipline means in this case means attending to what is, not only to, or not primarily to my hopes and fears, but others. And I commit to that. I commit to being a decent, uh, kind, fierce human being. And the kicker of bind yourself is even when no one's watching. So even many of us are in our houses by ourselves now. I'm I'm in my own quarantine. I'm in my office where I'm living right now. Um, Or even if you're not suddenly alone in your home, you may be suddenly at home and have the sense of, well, nobody's looking, so I will not put on pants. (laughs) Or, you know, I will just... uh, be kind of lazy. And I'm not saying you shouldn't relax. God forbid. I mean, we have to take it easy and rest and relax and space out and all those things. But if you think, well, nobody is watching, nobody's going to know I'm doing this, so I will indulge it. That's the kind of thing we want to watch out for. Like, are have you bound yourself to this uh, commitment to awareness, even when no one's watching? It doesn't mean you have to be uptight or perfect or like, some kind of, uh, you know, robot, Dharma robot, who does everything perfectly, you are warmly invited to do everything imperfectly with awareness. Uh, And when you screw up awareness, fabulous. Just be aware of that. So you kind of can't screw this up. The second form of discipline is gathering virtuous actions. This doesn't mean being a goody two-shoes. 
rather it means the way I interpret it, it interpret it is not thinking ever oh I understand that now therefore I will stop thinking about it put it in a box label it understood by Susan Piver and put it away gathering virtuous dharma dharmas means I'm going to keep looking I'm going to keep investigating I'm going to keep being curious I'm going to keep allowing what I believe I know to expand and not solidify overly. And then the final form of discipline is called, very straightforwardly, benefiting sentient beings. So this is exactly what it sounds like it is. It means you are always wondering somehow what is needed. So you are included in sentient beings, by the way. It doesn't mean benefiting all sentient beings except Susan Piver or or yourself. It means benefiting all sentient beings. Sometimes a sentient being that needs you the most is you. So the question, what is needed here, is relevant. Whether it's addressed to you, planet Earth, your child, your pet, whatever it is. But this third kind of discipline is what is needed. I'm going to hold that question as an open question all the time. That's a very powerful discipline. And at this particular moment in time, I don't need to tell you a very, very important and necessary discipline. So discipline doesn't mean being a hard ass. It means committing, binding yourself. Even when no one's watching, you're still a good person. Gathering virtuous dharmas, continuing to deepen your wisdom and understanding and compassion, and benefiting sentient beings, simply holding the question, What is needed? How can I help? So these are potent and very ordinary and simple things. I'm not saying they're easy, but they're very straightforward. So I hope this is useful. Next week I will come to you with Paramita number three, which is called Patience. So please stay well and let's meditate together. So begin your practice, please, by relaxing, which doesn't mean sagging. Rather, it means allowing yourself to be exactly as you are right now, including whatever you feel, including whatever is you hear, including whatever, wherever you are. Just let that be. Let the hands rest on the legs, palms down. Give your weight to the cushion or chair or sofa and feel heavy from the waist down and light from the waist up. Sit up straight, but with a sense of aliveness. You're not a steel rod that someone just stuck in the ground. You're alive, you're breathing, your body is making small movements. So you can sit up straight, including all of that. And let the front body soften a lot. The belly, the area around the heart, the throat. And let the shoulders relax. The chin is tucked a little bit, so the back of the neck is long. And the mouth is closed, but the lips and teeth can be slightly parted. The breath is natural in and out through the nose, just breathing. No breathing technique. And if you have a cold, adjust accordingly. The eyes are open and the gaze is cast down to a spot in front. Uh, Whatever is comfortable, given the distance of your screen. And the reason the eyes are open in this practice is because this is a practice of wakefulness. 
of being here. And it's easier to be awake and notice that you're here when your eyes are open. Let the gaze be soft. Imagine that your eyeballs could sit back a little bit in the sockets. So there's no sense of reaching out through the eyes. And the crown of the head reaches up a little bit. Now feel your body breathing or be with the sensation of breath, the gentle expansion on the inhale and the letting go of the exhale. Feeling the body breathe is different than observing the breath. It's simpler in a way. So stay with the inhale, ride the exhale. The next inhale will just happen, I promise. The amount of effort required from you is zero. So just begin again, feeling that in breath and this out breath. Your mind will continue to make thought. That's what it does. It's fine. Trying to make that stop is like looking out through your eyes and telling them not to see. Or your ears telling them not to hear. Rather, let your thoughts be as they are. Your mind will just keep churning them out. It's fine. No effort to change that. In the forefront is the breath. So as best you can, let the thoughts recede to the background. And should you notice that they switch places, meaning you become fully absorbed in thought. Excellent observation. Notice that. Call it thinking silently to yourself. Let go. I always feel a little bit of joy in the letting go. It's a relief. Bring your attention back to the breath gently and begin again, riding the waves of breath. So that's our practice and we'll sit together.
Thank you so much for your practice. Thank you for practicing with me. And thank you for practicing together. May you be healthy. May you be safe. May your immune system kick ass. I'll see you next week. <laughs>